All right, so if you watched my previous video on thrusting with the Japanese style sword, you saw that I did some repairs on stab him, but then I didn't stab him very much. And one of the reasons why I didn't do much of that in that video is I was saving it for this video because I had promised this video even before that when I did my video on comparative thrusting with straight blades. I said I'd do a separate one about curved swords and this seemed to be a great time to add Japanese style swords into that comparative equation. Also, finally got a little bit of a break from the heat dome, so it's a little bit cooler. And, well, let's say I got some bad news today, and I'm inspired to do a little stabbing. So, let's get into it. You ready, buddy? Caveats to get out of the way, as always, I don't consider myself any kind of master expert, anything like that. And for some of these swords, really not at all. I'm just starting to practice with them in the last year or so. Versus others I've been handling for decades. And you may see the difference. Caveat two, I never intend to contradict anything that you were being taught studying, practicing. Caveat three, this is never intended to be the teaching of any traditional system whatsoever. It's just the way I do things. And I'm going to have to actually kind of dial it back. Some of these swords are actually really powerful thrusters. But the way I have stab them supported in the limited space, I'm going to have to dial it well pretty pretty thoroughly back, but I'm trying to get it consistent across all the blades within a couple of different parameters. For those parameters, go back to my videos, yes, homework time, on Pragmatic Chinese Gen, where I introduced my concept, at least, of the difference between stabbing and thrusting. For me, a thrust is an action with the tip that is as much in line with the arm as it can be. And a straight blade definitely excels at this compared to a curved one, but we'll see the differences to different extremes. It will have more reach and potentially better bodied mechanics behind it. And I think most people agree it's a lot easier to aim in terms of accuracy as compared to a stab, which is a closer range not so straight line movement, which comes more from a hammer grip, sword more at right angles to your arm. Sometimes this is mandated by the design of the sword, as we'll see. But yeah, it really does change the, uh, change the equation. Different chaining of energy. For me, definitely harder to aim. You don't get the same kind of body mechanics behind it. We'll see what the differences are. But going back to my video on thrusting with the Japanese style sword, we talked a little bit about, well, those differences but also differences in blade angle. So let me just go back over that as I demonstrate Japanese sword. One of the big things I pointed out in Japanese sword that makes the biggest difference, sori, curvature. So I'll start with one that is, well, pretty straight, comparatively speaking. It has what has become a very common Uchigatana Shinogi Zukiri profile curve, which is not as severe as other swords we're gonna take a look at. So I don't find that one very, very difficult to thrust with. It lines up pretty well. Now when we talk about angles of thrusting, I, I did rotate through a complete version of that, but I'm gonna concentrate on two this time. One with the blade kind of angled 45 degrees downward and the other one in that sort of cloud guard. So you can see how those work. So without too much room to move, I'm gonna use the handshake grip, more of a thrust. And if I come forward, as I talked about in the previous videos, my favorite mechanics is a body arms kind of movement versus an arms body kind of movement used in HEMA. I'll rock into it and thrust out into the target. So you can see I can really get my body behind this and it hits pretty solidly with pretty much no effort on my part. And it made, I'll zoom in on the target later, a pretty sizable hole. I also talked about how I prefer a shorter tip, shorter Kasaki, because it's less likely to get damaged. For me, hits targets, harder targets harder. And combined then with the curvature of the blade, it opens up quite a wound channel, for lack of a better term. Try not to get demonetized here. If I move into that over the top, and I talked about how difficult that one can be, yeah, it's a little bit different body mechanics. You see I'm kind of leaning on it in certain ways. But yeah, it can be pretty effective. And my accuracy, eh, about like that. 
Again, I'll show pictures as we go. But if I'm stabbing, if I'm close like this, yeah, that definitely changes the body mechanics. But it can be done. My accuracy tends to get lost a little bit. They group, we use a term from a certain other form of martial arts that requires a trigger warning. Yeah, it opens up a bit, but it's still effective. Now, let's change the equation. <sighs> Much more curved. Tachi, you guys remember ground chicken? Yeah, I'm coming to love ground chicken more and more as time goes by. He's actually pretty tough. But a lot of things change. Lining this up, not only in terms of aiming the thing, but just the body mechanics. It changes everything. Where I put my hands, how I align the suka, everything changes the more curve you get. So as I come into the target, yeah, it's just it's a little bit different. My hands don't feel as in line with it, and therefore neither does the rest of my body. But it still works pretty well. And one of the things you may not have noticed is when this hit, it opened up a cut in that target that was about an inch wider because it hit with, again, more curve. Try it this way. Yeah, a little bit harder for me to aim, so it opened up my grouping a little bit. And you'll notice it did turn out to be a little bit more like a stab than a thrust. Now, if I do get close, it's funny, I actually get my accuracy back if I go for those stab mechanics. So, kind of not what you would think would happen, but it's at least what happens for me. Let's open this up to other kinds of swords and see what happens. Quick interlude. All of the other curved swords I'm going to show you are one-handed. Didn't really cover that in my Japanese style sword thrusting video, but mechanics, yeah, all the other rules are going to be similar. I feel like one-handed swordsmanship gives me more freedom of movement, potentially a little bit more reach, but not nearly as stable. So when I thrust with a blade like this, and I'll do the same angles and about the same pressure, yeah, my accuracy, it declines a little bit. I also feel a little bit better thrusting from different angles that would otherwise twist my hands up if this was a two-handed action, but I can get a reasonable amount of power. Definitely, however, feel I hit a lot harder with the two-handed thrust, so that is going to make a difference. All right, moving on. All right, one particular extreme case, the Tulwar. Now, there are certainly different blade lengths and curvatures. This is just my one example. The cold steel doesn't have a lot of curve, but certainly somewhat more than a Japanese-style sword. Blade length, however, is about the same, so take that into account. Obviously, one-handed only, but as I pointed out in the review of this blade and then the follow-up video where I tried to be helpful, let people know what they were potentially getting into if they weren't familiar with one of these and they bought one, restrictedness of the hilt, especially the disc. So a long one-handed thrust, it's just not, it's not gonna work very well. I've gotta go with more of a stab, which can be kind of hard to aim. However, if I exaggerate things with this sword, really bring that hilt close to me, using those two angles I've been showing, that allows me to get my body, I think, behind it more. So I can use a lot more body leverage mechanics Accuracy, well, it's a little bit worse. Again, I get a pretty good hole in the target because of the curvature of the blade. Let's try it on that odd side of the body that I wouldn't be able to do as easily with a two-handed sword. Yeah. That is not quite as strong, at least the way I'm feeling it. If I can get my body behind it somewhere in here, I can get a pretty good solid but short stab out of it. All right, how does this translate to a couple of other swords? All right, the Windless 1860 Union Saber, a reasonable example of a French-ish saber. 
moderate curve. It's a longer blade. It's not nearly as restrictive in the hilt, but there are certain restrictions of any curved sword as compared to any straight blade. How does it play out? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. One, if I use a standard handshake grip, and yeah, I have to back up a lot more because it's a longer sword and thrust in. I feel like I've got similar to the katana in what I can get behind it and how well I can aim it. Okay, the overhand one was a little sloppier, but my overhand thrust is just a little bit sloppier in general. From the outside, yeah, not too bad. Definitely have a lot more play in the hand. I don't have to do that close stab that I did with the Talwar, but yeah, I could if I wanted to get that or reinforce it with the other hand. It gives me a little bit more body behind it. So that's a that's an option. Let's try a saber grip. I'll put my poor wounded thumb on the back of the blade here and try one that way. Oh, I really missed. Sorry. <laughs> Well, just let's call it out of bounds. Uh, I'm not used to thrusting this way, probably because my, my thumb is in such bad shape. I can get my hand on there now, but I just I don't have the strength in this grip myself, which shows you, well, how uncomfortable I am with blades like this. Let's take a look at another one. Market Garden significantly reprofiled, but still kind of still market garden. A lot, a lot, a lot more curved. Let's see what happens. Now, yeah, you can certainly extend a sword like this really long and use that saber grip. I'm not going to use the saber grip with this one because I've already proven I don't have a good grip or aim on the sword when I do that. So I'm going to use a handshake in those two angles that I've been showing with the other two swords first. So coming out here, and went a little bit high, and then coming in with the edge more up, actually mostly centered a little bit to the right. So it's kind of, my hits are going in the direction of the tip. If I come over to the other side, yeah, my hits drift a couple of inches, well, in the, in the direction the sword's going. So yeah, um, and I actually just went high. I just really don't feel I can get myself behind it. Now, if I come in close, which is not traditional for a saber, and drive it in like the Talwar here, well, yeah, my accuracy kind of comes back and I feel a whole lot better about getting me behind the sword. So, I don't have any other curved European swords to show you. Why? Because, well, I'm not any good with them. They just don't. I thought they'd be great, uh, great exploration of Hema, but yeah, I definitely seem to prefer straighter blades. And if I'm going for a weapon in this class, it's going to be a basket hilted straight sword. So back sword, broad sword, something like that. Yeah, I've tried these out so far. They just haven't taken with me, but I also wasn't terribly comfortable when I was studying Chinese swordsmanship with a really curved, like a willow leaf dao or something like that. So, yeah, it's carrying over to these. Let's look at one more. Kogarasu Maru. Kind of going back in that realm of familiarity. Double-edged or back swordish, however you want to look at it, Japanese style sword. Getting to be more common on the markets today. You think it would be potentially a little bit more thrust suitable? In certain ways, absolutely. But it's still pretty much in the same mechanics as other Uchi Gatana. So let's take a look at it. First of all, let's do one handed and take a look at a couple of those comfortable angles. This way, pretty accurate. Overhand, not too bad. Outside, not too bad. Close to body stab. Yeah, not bad at all. Switching to two hands. Longer thrust. Overhand, close. Yeah, my accuracy is coming back, definitely. So I think the rule for me is there's a certain amount of curvature 
that I'm very, very comfortable with. Now, this wasn't nearly as accurate as some of the things I can do with a perfectly straight sword, but within the realm of acceptable. I feel like I've just been out doing target practice for you. Um, yeah, I'll take it. Anyway, not a bad result. But, all right, something I mentioned in the previous video. One more thing, I promise. Okay, so it's not a curved blade, but in the video I did on comparing thrusts with the, the straight European style swords, I never got around to these because again, a two-handed thrusting mechanic, very different, but since we're talking about two-handed thrusting mechanics with Japanese style swords, let's go for it, just for fun. So this is my Cold Steel Italian. And you need a little bit more room because it's got a longer blade. But again, I could use thrusting or stabbing mechanics with this. So going a little bit long, and I'm not going to go very hard. This thing will hit hard and penetrate nice and deep. I can certainly, yeah, get a good extension. That one was a little bit lower than I expected, probably because I've been practicing with a curved sword, and this one's straight. Let me arc that edge up. Yeah, still going just a little bit offline compared to where I expect it. If I get my body behind it for more of the stab, yeah, that recovers everything for me, gets my feel back. But yeah, any kind of straight blade, I just feel like I can get more, more behind it with my body mechanics. A one-handed straight sword, yeah, especially so. Big difference. As soon as we add either curve into the equation or that second hand potentially bringing the sword somewhat out of line, depending on how you grip in it, that's when things get a tad challenging. But as you've seen, a good stable two-handed thrust, yeah, hits really hard. Thrusts with really curved swords that are supposedly not designed for thrusting can still be quite effective. So, <sighs> Let's get that conversation going in the comments. What are your experiences? What are you training, practicing? Where do you struggle? Where do you excel? What works for you? What's not working so well for you? Again, I'll try to answer whatever questions you might have, and those comments do then inspire many, many, many new video topics. So keep it all coming. Otherwise, until next time, I hope this was useful, informative, enlightening, entertaining. <laughs> And I do hope to see you back for more.